How is this book different from the other two previous Frankie books? I had an opportunity two years ago to go to a remote atoll off of Hawaii. You fly to Honolulu and then it's another three hours by charter okay. flight to get Good. to this remote I'm with 12 complete strangers and Mm -hmm. phenomenally humid to the point they talk about the fungus that grows on their skin. And yes, there's these crazy coconut crabs who are absolutely terrifying and bigger than my dog. It's the perfect place to set a suspense novel. So Frankie gets to go to the tropics. Bookaholics, welcome to joining me today. Today we have some really big book energy. We have a number one New York Times bestselling author and a master of the psychological thriller. Welcome, Lisa Gardner. Thank you so much. I'm so glad we're finally able to make this work. Yes, me too. Me too. Well, I am really excited because, and I will confess, I haven't read any of your books, even though that is my genre, mysteries and thrillers, but I have received, uh, still see you everywhere. I have started reading it and I am hooked. I'll just say that to start. I am hooked. Let's go ahead and dive into our protagonist. Her name is Frankie Elkin. I wanted to make sure I got that right. Frankie Elkin. So Frankie, you you started her series in 2021. Did the pandemic have anything to do with the development of Frankie Elkin and that whole series? Actually, it wasn't COVID per se. It was, I had been writing the same series for a long time, the Detective Dee Dee Warren novels, which are very popular, and I always loved that character. But I was just ready to try something fresh. Frankie, for me, is the first, uh, what we call an amateur sleuth. I mean, she's not police or FBI. She's an everyday person, and her obsession is trying to solve missing persons cold cases. And to be honest, we have hundreds of thousands of missing people out there no one's looking for at all. So in fact, we need a lot more Frankie Elkins out in the world. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. And I like, I love that, that you are bringing awareness in a, in a subtle way through your writing series that there are hundreds of thousands of people that go missing every year, a lot of people of color uh, or adjacent to a person of color, and nobody's really looking for them. You know, tons and tons of women go missing. And so I love that aspect that you are bringing about awareness of that. And and you seem to do, as I've been reading, I still see you everywhere, you very quickly, you're bringing awareness to a lot of situations, not only to that aspect, but also Kaylee's, our serial killer in this case, to her life and why she even did such heinous crimes. So I love the way you have developed your stories. It's, it's genius, actually. But let me go back. I'm, so I'm geeking out a little bit. So let me go back to this. Now, Frankie is a recovering alcoholic. So she's also not only just an everyday amateur sleuth, she's also a flawed human being. So why did you want to incorporate Recovering Alcoholic into the store, into your Frankie series? Well, I think the fundamental question when you meet someone, because there are Frankies in the real world, is why? I mean, who gives up everything? I mean, she doesn't have a permanent address. She doesn't have a stable job. She doesn't have any long-term relationships, you know, to literally go from town to town looking for people that others, for whatever reason, don't even seem to care about. Why would you do that? And that's kind of where her recovering alcoholism goes in. She is obsessive. She is concerned that maybe this whole thing is her being a dry drunk. You know, she's replaced one addiction with another. But Uh. at the same time, she feels it is the work that keeps her sober. I mean, she, and what is that old adage? It's always easier to solve someone else's problems. You know? Yes. That yes. makes my work for her. If she stops, if she thinks about herself too much, 
then it, her sobriety is much more in question. <laughs> yes, yes, and that that is a true, very true uh, adage, you know. And and so to say that, you know, she doesn't have a stable job, like you said, she rode a Greyhound bus to the prison. Uh, she got sustenance out of a vending uh, from a convenience store before, but before contemplating getting food out of a vending machine. Yep. You know, <laughs> so how is it that Frankie can afford to do all of this charity work, major charity work? Well, I mean, one of the things that's true in Frankie's life is, uh, you know, she's always watching funds. She works generally in marginalized and communities, you know, more dangerous, you know, not the great neighborhoods. Um, and she is a bartender, which always mm -hmm. sounds weird because should an alcoholic be a bartender, but she's Good. kind of famous for saying it's not being around booze that makes her want to drink. It's getting up every morning. Oh, wow. So Kaylee, your serial killer does have some aspects of humanity, even though she had a rough start in life and then went to a guy that was not good for her. Why do you want to give such a butchering, you know, serial killer an aspect of humanity? Because she apparently she loves her sister more than anything. That was her stabilizer. Yeah, I love complex characters, and I think it's just more compelling and more believable to read. I mean, Frankie herself, one of the reasons she's really good at what she does is she did spend most of her adult life as a drunk, and she's mm -hmm. been in jail, and she's done, made terrible life decisions, <laughs> done many bad things. So she's completely right. non judgmental. I mean, she's been there, done that. On the other side, yeah. when you have someone like, Kaylee, who is an unabashed, unrepentant serial killer. Like if she could get out tomorrow, she would do it again. But yes. she also, she loves her baby sister. And this yeah. opportunity three weeks before her own execution, that maybe her little sister who was kidnapped 15 years ago might still be alive and need yes. help. I mean, that is everything to her. So that is now her dying wish. Will Frankie please go save her sister? And we can yes. relate to Yes, most definitely. Most definitely. Now, there's another character in the book, Mac, who is supposedly maybe holding the little sister, uh, who is now probably in her late teens. Yep. Now, why did you pick a tech giant? Of course, he this tech giant has all types of resources. So I'm assuming his resources is building the world where it's difficult for Frankie to penetrate and stuff later on in the book that sustains that. But was there an underlying, you know, tech giants are kind of seen as the enemy of our society today. Was there an underlying thought of making a tech giant uh, the bad guy also in this book? Well, to be honest, when I was in Hawaii doing the research and some of this book, again, started out with Frankie helps people no one else is looking for. And the amount of human trafficking going on in Hawaii right now is a yes. huge huge concern. And yeah, interesting yeah. enough, Hawaii is being pretty much bought out by the tech moguls of the world. It is something that locals do nothing but talk about. Like Mark Zuckerberg has like several of the islands now. So oh my God. Of the state belongs to them. Wow. Oh, <laughs> so oh, wow. it's topical and timely. <laughs> yeah. Yes, most definitely. And, and again, that's part of the genius of this book that not only that, what you were saying about tech giants buying up the island, and then, you know, we're talking about the human trafficking and all of this, very topical, but timely, and yet entertaining. Yeah. Uh, I just, it's totally genius in this. So Frankie's series began with Before She Disappeared, that was number one. One Step Too Far was the second book, and now we have Still See You Everywhere, the third. Now, how is this book different from the other two Frankie, uh, previous Frankie books, or do they, uh, outside of her finding missing persons who no one is thinking about, how is this one different? Well, the fun thing with the Frankie books is she can and does go anywhere. So a huge part of Still See You Anywhere, Everywhere, sorry, <laughs> is yeah. the tropical location. I had an opportunity two years ago to go to a remote atoll off of Hawaii. Like you fly to Honolulu and then it's another three hours by charter okay. flight to get Good. to this remote location. 12 oh. people, uh, I remember our the charter jet, jet leaving and looking all around and realizing I'm with 12 complete strangers. And uh -huh. 
phenomenally humid to the point they talk about the fungus that grows on their skin. And yes, there's these crazy coconut crabs who are absolutely terrifying and bigger than my dog running around everywhere and realizing, oh. I mean, there's no chance of rescue. There's no hope of escape. I mean, it's the perfect place to, you know, set a suspense novel. So Frankie gets to go to the tropics. <laughs> Just like so yeah. mayhem. <laughs> wow. Oh my gosh. I don't think I would want to visit that with fungus growing on your skin. Oh, I think that would just take me out. <laughs> it was interesting psychologically speaking, because I, mean, I was actually there to learn about some the ecological reclamation of coral for reefs. Yeah. It's wet. It's wet all the time. I mean, your towel's wet, your sheets are wet, your skin's. I mean, by day three, we were all getting really, really punchy. So, I mean, you not only have that isolation, but you are, it's very rustic living. Um, you know, it's, there's no plumbing or electricity or anything like that. So it was fun to watch us. I mean, it felt a little bit like Gilligan's Island, like soon we needed oh. to get off this or bad things were going to wow. happen. Wow. Oh my goodness. <laughs> wow. Goodness. Well, now do you, we have three Frankie books, Frankie Elkin books. Yep. Do you see, how far do you see Frankie going? Do you have a forecast for Frankie? Do you see her at this is it? Do you see her at 10? Do you see her as a movie? Because you have some movies out there from your books. Yeah, I don't plan too far ahead. I am working on the fourth Frankie Elkin book. Because oh. I'm part of my travels a couple years ago. I also met a couple who volunteer to help settle Afghan refugees in Tucson. And you want to talk about an at-risk community, some really, really tragic stories. There's, again, it's an opportunity to show an issue, but I think also the best books let you walk in someone else's shoes. Yes. There's a lot going on with the Afghan community and resettlement of refugees in general. So that has been a, a, an amazing book to both research and now write. Yes, 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 yes. Wow. Well, what made you even want to go into writing mysteries and thrillers, Lisa? I've always been drawn to mysteries. Um, I grew up reading them. They're always my favorite. I joke my family. We like puzzles and strategy games and things like that. And, yeah. um, you know, the puzzle, who did it, how they did it, the psychology behind it. Like, you know, is evil born or made? I mean, why do you have someone like Kaylee, a female serial killer, which is less common? But yeah, right. you can find some fascinating studies on as well. And I just, I find all of that endlessly fun. Yes. Well, you know, you should enjoy your work. <laughs> so it sounds like you definitely do. Now, there is a section on your website where you're giving um, information to aspiring writers. And I love that, uh, that you're sharing um, information to writers, whereas you could not you know, you don't have to do that, really. So um, what advice would you give someone who's just starting to write and taking that chance to becoming an author? Well, the first thing we all authors will talk about is um, you have to finish what you start. Um, mm. you, you have to reach the end. And it's the hardest thing to do, especially when you're first starting out. You have a great idea. You sit down, you write a couple chapters, maybe. And it's hard. And you get kind of stuck and you think of another idea and, oh, this idea is better. So then you write a couple chapters of it. And if you're not careful, 10 years have gone by and you've gen generated a couple of chapters in many, many different areas, but no completed manuscript. You need yes. a complete book and it can be awful. It can be terrible. We call them the vomit drafts. You can absolutely have a vomit draft. Now, then the next step is to start fixing it and making it great. Wow, that is great advice. Just finish what you definitely finish what you start, no matter what the outcome of, of that is. Wow, that is some great advice. So what is the most important aspect of writing a mystery? Is it the plot or the characters? Because you've got very, like I said, I'm just started reading, still see you everywhere. And you have some very strong characters in the first 25 pages. So uh, what is what is more important? I'm a character driven writer. I mean, mm -hmm. even the opening okay. prologue of Still See You Everywhere, which is the beautiful butcher, you know, mourning her sister that came yeah. to me first. I mean, I, I mean, all of that just 
came to me first as if she were speaking to me. So for mm-hmm. me, it will always be about the character. And when I meet with readers, I just had a really great book tour. That's what they all comment on. They fall madly in love with the characters and they yes. will not them anywhere. <laughs> yes, yes. And I just heard you mention speaking to you. I've interviewed hundreds of authors and a lot of times they'll say that the characters speak to you. So is this the case with you? And And I don't even plot. I mean, I don't have an outline. Um, I'm what we call a pantser, writing by the seat of your pants. And for me, it's very much um, at a certain point, the characters take over and they figure out the story. And I'm just along for the ride. Got you. Got you. Now, we've got so many things in society today with AI. We've got all types of randomizers. How do you come up with the names of the characters in your stories? Oh, um, sometimes it's as simple as Googling things. Um, I actually did a project once for Sandra Bullock. And what she Mm -hmm. liked to do is figure out the age of a character and then the Google, like the most popular names the year that character was born. Just yes. have some authenticity. Um, and then I do have fun. Uh, we just restarted it on the website, lisagardner.com. There's the mm-hmm. Kill a Friend Mamba Buddy sweepstakes, and you can nominate the person of your choice to die in my book. So I let readers help with this project as well. <laughs> wow. I didn't see that part when I was checking out your website. I'll have to go back to see that. <laughs> wow. 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 Well, now, so Lisa, what mystery writers have influenced you in your own writing? Well, I mean, certainly Mary Higgins, Clark, Agatha Christie, Stephen King. It's interesting. You can almost tell writers of my generation of a certain age because it's mm-hmm. Stephen King, Stephen King, Stephen King. You know, we yes. grew up in his books and he is the number one influence on our yes. in our writing styles. And he made popular fiction and, or writing to entertain worthy because up yes. until then, if you were an aspiring writer, it was like, you know, you need to be writing the great American novel or something like that. And yes. most of suspense, we never wanted to write the great American novel. We wanted something, you know, fun, commercial fiction, uh, dark and stormy night, and how to get away with murder. And Stephen yes. King, that, you know, the thing to write and to be. So thank heavens. Yes, wonderful. I, I did at a period in my life, loved reading all the Stephen King books. And I probably read about 10 when I was a lot younger. So yes, I can definitely relate to that. Now, not only do you have the Frankie Elkin series, but you have other, you have an FBI character that has their series. You have other main characters of series. When your fans approach you, like you just got finished with your book tour, I believe you finished your book tour. And do you have fans come up to you and say, do they prefer one main character of a series over another? Yeah, it's always fun. I, I joke we should get everyone t-shirts. It's like team Dee Dee Warren, team Flora, team Kimberly Quincy, who's the FBI profiler. And I did a book a couple years ago where I brought all of them into the same book because I think it was on Facebook. I even did a poll, like what, who would read yours? And it was so evenly split. It was like 20, 20%. So I'm like, okay, well then why pick? We'll just have them all on a book. And it was actually a great deal of fun. <laughs> Yes. Oh, wow. That sounds like a lot of fun. Well, Lisa Gardner, please count me as now a new fan of yours. I'll be finishing up, still see you everywhere. And I may go back to read the other Frankie Elkin books because they're all standalone. So a person can pick up a a Frankie book and not feel obligated to go back to one or two unless they want to. Correct. I think yes. it's important that they always be a standalone because that's how we discover books and authors generally, not, rarely in sequential order. Yes, 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 yes. That is uh, some pretty good piece of advice. So definitely, I really appreciate you being on the Bookaholic podcast today. And uh, thank you so much for writing. The world is better for it. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you.